again for the third installment of the World War II series. This is my third video for the day, so hopefully my voice lasts through this video. But we're going to pick up where we left off with the Battle of Atlantic, which was a battle over supply routes. Now, essential for these massive wars, World War I and World War II, were providing soldiers with um, what they needed to continue fighting, but also to provide, you know, uh, means of, you know, international trade and, 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 and things like that to uh, maintain each country's economies as best as possible as well throughout this time. So for military strategic purposes, purposes but also just standard of living and the ability to maintain global trade to keep their respective economies going. So Britain's survival in the war depends on massive shipments of supplies, especially food materials from the United States. Germany tries to destroy these shipments as often as possible, and U-boats, the German submarines, are very, very effective in doing this. They are very difficult to uh, track down, to uh, hunt down and kill, uh, and you've got ships that are trying to travel in convoy, and they're using depth charges, and, and they're trying to wipe out these U-boats, but there is a constant fear that your ship could be taken out at any, any time. Uh, from 40, 1940 to 1942, Germany's winning. Each month, U-boats sink thousands of tons of ship and cargo. And the Allies gradually begin to overcome the U-boat danger. They're using new sonar technologies to locate submarine aircraft, uh, which are scanning the ocean, ocean, you know, for the silhouette of a submarine near the surface. And they're bombing, like I said, using depth charges, etc. But then, more importantly, Hitler was less a fan of submarines and more a fan of giant battleships with big guns. Um, Hitler was someone who really had an appreciation for and, and uh, really liked scale. Um, in, in one of his hobbies would be to draw giant, sketch giant tanks, and he liked big, big guns. And U-boats are sneaky underwater uh, vessels they're not giant battleships, and he wanted to spend more money and time on building giant battleships as opposed to submarines. By mid-1943, the Allies were sinking U-boats faster than Germany is replacing them, and the supply routes are, are uh, safe on it once again. Uh, my great uncle, actually, was one of the merchant marines that uh, ran one of these supply lines, or ran a couple of these supply lines trying to get supplies to the Allies during World War II. Extremely da dangerous. Um, I do want to note, Allied merchant ship vessel losses, it's not just over here by Europe. There are losses right on the eastern seaboard and near, you know, uh, Central and South America. This was all over the Atlantic. So when we call it the Battle of the Atlantic, it was the Battle of the entire Atlantic, essentially. Okay, the United States enters the war. So the U.S. has stayed neutral. Uh, they tried to stay neutral in World War I, partially due to a long-standing policy of just let the Europeans do what they're going to do, based on the Monroe Doctrine that came out very early on in America's history saying, hey, Europeans, you stay out of America, we'll stay out of European affairs. And so there's been a long-standing tradition in America to stay out of European problems in, in Europe. And especially after the First World War, there was a lot of Americans who didn't want to get involved in the second. And so when it begins in, in Europe, Roosevelt announces their neutrality. Um, Churchill asks for aid, and he gives aid where he can. He's sending supplies and 
and, and trying to keep the English afloat you know, via supply lines, but they're not actually entering the war. The majority of the U.S. for other countries should stay out of the war. Um, that was the, the popular vote. Uh, however, nearly everyone hoped the Allies would win over Hitler. Okay. So Roosevelt hopes to defeat the Axis powers by equipping them with ships, tanks, aircraft, other war materials. Um, Roosevelt called the United States the ar arsenal of democracy. In all, about $50 billion in aid were sent to Allied nations. Half went to Great Britain, one-fourth went to the Soviet Union, and, and, and then um, other smaller nations as well. And this was one of the big, I apologize, it's very blurry, I didn't realize that. Um, this is one of the big organizations, uh, SOS, Save Our Sons, uh, voting for no convoys, no war, no death for American boys. And it's an anti-war, anti-entering into you, a World War II campaign that was very, very popular at the time. Okay, And then the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor. Now, the Americans saw what was going on with with Japan. They didn't like how you know aggressive the Japanese had gotten, and they stopped supplying them with U.S. steel and cutting off supply lines and, and stopping trade. And Japan realizes it's an enemy and decides on a preemptive preemptive strike against the Americans. So it ends up being Japan, not Germany, that plunges the U.S. into war. In 1940, Japan's fighting and conquering places in Asia, and they need all the supplies they can get. They're running out of uh, scrap metal, petroleum from the U.S. Uh, the United States was um, one of the large oil suppliers in, in the world, you know, with the Rockefellers, etc. And the United States, armed by Japan's expansion, cut off trade with Japan, and Japan considers this hostile. So uh, General Hideki Tojo rule, is ruling Japan at the time as the shogun, and he and his top generals knew that only the United States Navy has the power to stop, the, the, stop Japan from further conquest in the Pacific. So they decide to cripple the U.S. fleet, with one forceful blow, they have intelligence that like, the majority of the United States Navy is at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. And so without war warning on December 7th, 1941, the Japanese attack the U.S. fleet at Pearl Harbor. The bombing is an amazing success on the Japanese, part, uh, from the Japanese point of view. It disabled much of the Pacific fleet. But in the long run, it proves disastrous for, for Japan because the Americans who did not want to enter the war originally are now very much in favor of this war. Um, and uh, Americans are kind of like that throughout history. Um, it's, it's one of those, you know, you, you hear the metaphor, like, you know, don't, don't poke a sleeping bear. And that, that's kind of one of these situations. On December 8th, the United States, Canada, and Great Britain declare war on Japan. December 11th, Germany and Italy declare war on the U.S., and now the United States is involved. People all over Europe are thankful the U.S. The US is in, in the war because during World War I, we were hugely in our instrumental, the United States was hugely in, instrumental in winning the First World War. So now the Americans have joined the fight, and there is hope again. And now they stand a chance of, of winning. So you've got Pearl Harbor here, who is you know, being attacked by first wave and second wave from the other side. And this is one of the reasons why it was so easy for the Japanese to take out and destroy so many of the ships. They were all lined up in a row. Nice little rows, and so you know you could just go along and sink one after the other, essentially. And it was just hugely devastating to the British fleet. It was a huge loss of life. It was a very tragic event in American history. Okay, 
the Allied strategy, the big three are Roosevelt, the Americans, Churchill, the British, Stalin's, and Russia. Those are the three big Allied powers. Together, they come up with a strategy for a hopeful victory. And leaders feel that Germany is the most dangerous of the two main enemies, being you know Japan, Italy, and uh, in in Europe. But then Japan, uh, sorry, Germany, Italy, Europe, and then Japan as well. They were. They are going to concentrate on defeating Germany more than any of the others. And they would only accept an unconditional surrender from the Axis powers. They're not going to accept a truce, or a, a tree, any other type of treaty or an armistice or anything like that. Okay, It's all or nothing. On the Soviet front, on the Eastern Front, the tide turned for the Germans in 1941, and they begin to be pushed back. Remember, in the last video, the Germans slowed their advance into October. It become it freezes over the winter, and they're deadlocked. And the Soviet Union is able to recoup and you know resupply and fight back. And they begin to be pushed back and never recovered the offensive that uh, they had going into Russia initially. Fighting is fierce, often hand-to-hand. -hand. The losses in the Eastern Front were just absolutely terrible. About 300,000 German troops were killed or captured, and uh, but an equal number of Soviet troops were, uh, were killed. Here you see the big three, Stalin, Roosevelt, Churchill, respectively. North Africa, or Rommel is, but at the same time that the Germans were being pushed back in the Soviet Union, they were de being defeated in North Africa. They had advanced as far as Alamein in Egypt, and here the British halted his advance, counterattack, Rush, or, or Rommel, excuse me, is forced to retreat. Soon after the Battle of Alamein, uh, Al Alamein? Uh, Allied forces invade French colonies in Northern Africa. Uh, Allied troops under General Eisenhower landed in Algeria and Morocco on uh, November 8, 1942. Now, if you have not seen the classic film Casablanca about this era and, the, and uh, uh, this this time period, um, highly highly recommend you see this that film. It is one of the best movies of all time, um, hands down. Really, really good. Go watch Casablanca. Anyways, Vichy France, that, you know, southern France that was being, you know, ruled by the French, but really they were serving the Germans. Uh, forces fought back for a few days and then ended up joining the Allies' side, actually, because, you know, people like Charles de Gaulle have kept the hope, hope alive, and, you know, they ended up fighting back. The Germans were only left in uh, Tanzania. I I probably pronounced that wrong. And here they plan to, to make a stand. Uh, American troops first fought against the Germans in February 1943. Rommel's defeated, the, uh, defeats the inexperienced Americans in hard fighting. And after this, the Allies steadily close in. And they there's a lot of lessons learned as, as far as tank warfare is concerned by fighting Rommel. The last Axis forces in Africa surrender in May. Rommel turns to Germany. The Allies now have bases from which to attack Southern Europe. So now they're controlling Southern Africa. They've also got a staging point in England, and they can start advancing towards the Rhineland, towards Germany. And then you've got the Russians closing in from the Eastern Front as well. Okay. Strategic importance of Alamein. Okay, you've got the Suez Canal, which is the control point between the Red Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. Hugely important for controlling both of these these seas and pushing the um, the Germans out of North Africa was hugely important for maintaining control of this region. The air war against Germany. So, I talked about the air war against Britain. Now, 
we begin the air war against Germany, aimed at destroying the, its ability to keep fighting by hitting railroads, factories, and other industrial targets. Uh, begin nighttime raids that are safer than daytime time raids uh, because it's not like they had guided missiles, heat-seeking guided missiles at this point in time. You know, they're essentially dumb firing, you know, flak and, you know, machine guns, etc. at aircraft. They're a lot harder to hit in the dark, but they're often missing their targets because, again, the bombers have a hard time seeing the ground as well. And so they turn to what is called saturation bombing. So massive raids on an entire city, and the first of, oh, that's a typo, first of these was on May 30th, 1942, in the city of Cologne, Germany. And the U.S. Um, joined the, uh, the air war against Germany with B-17 bomber, the Flying Fortress, more accurate than the British bombers, had better armor, and could take a lot of punishment. And these nighttime raids against German cities with saturation bombing were absolutely atrocious. I mean, because they're just, it would have been later called carpet bombing, where there's just hundreds and hundreds of bombs being dropped against whole cities. And huge losses of civilian life. And please remember that not it's not the German people that were evil. I mean, it's Hitler and the Nazis that, uh, and there's a lot of innocent people who are just living in this country trying to also go about their daily lives and support their families, etc., who were then um, subject to, you know, this horrible, you know, firebombing that, that was going on. Um, the records of during this time period with this type of bombing were it's called firebombing because it turned the city got so cities would get so hot that um, it would melt anything that was exposed and outside and I forgot to turn my phone off again there we go okay Americans favor pinpoint bombing targets during daylight hours they mount guns on on their bombers and they start bombing raids around the clock, so nighttime and daytime bombing. In spite of this bombardment, bombardment, German industries increased production and German morale did not crack. There's a huge propaganda campaign going on during this time and they continue to produce uh, weapons and soldiers for the war effort. Okay, The air achieved its goals only during the last 10 months of the war and in that Time, nearly three times as many bombs fell in Germany as, as in all the rest of the war. Um, air attacks ramp up as the, as the war continues. Technology also speeds up as the war goes on. By the end of the war, German cities lay in ruins, factories, refineries, railroads, canals, secrets ceased to operate. Hundreds of thousands of German civilians have been killed. Millions more were homeless. And after the war, um, there's a huge restructuring and rebuilding effort that goes into completely rebuilding Germany. Um, lessons were learned from the First World War. The invasion of Italy. So Eisenhower later becomes our president, but this time he's he's a general, lands in Sicily, sends some paratroopers in, some some army rangers, and for 39 days they fought hard against the determined. German troops, and, and which were defeated on August 17th, and on July the 25th, Mussolini ends up falling from power. The Italian government imprisoned him. The German paratroopers rescue him later. In the meantime, Italy is surrendering on September 3rd. Um, so the circle is tightening around Germany. Germans determined to fight Italy, regardless of, of the Italian surrender. Um, the Allies slowly struggled to dupe the Italian peninsula in a series of head-on assaults against the well-defended German positions. You know, these massive forts and, and well-defended well positions. Okay, So the Allies, they take heavy casualties, but they end up breaking through German lines in May of 1944. And Rome ends up falling in, on June 4th. German hold northern Italy for several months, but in the spring, German forces and surrender. Mussolini recaptured. 
shot by a Italian resistance fighter, so thus ends Mussolini in, you know, April of, uh, of uh, 1944, okay? So this is Allied in, in invasion of Italy, and as of 2010, we still have soldiers in Italy. Um, yeah, Germany as well, okay? So, the tide turns, D-Day. Throughout 1943, preparations are being made for landing in France and starting a, a full-blown land offensive on the European continent, pushing towards Berlin. And the invasion received the code name Operation Overlord. So that is the name of the operation for D-Day. Okay. The Germans knew the Allies planned to invade, they just don't know when and where. So Hitler places Rommel, the tank commander, in charge of strengthening the coastal defenses. And they receive intelligence uh, that the British and American forces are going to land near Calais. I believe that's how, how it's pronounced at the lowest part of the English uh, Channel. But the Allies plan on, on going further south in a region called Normandy. So they misled the Germans through false um, through false intelligence. The fortifications are, are, are built up near Calais and then the Allies end up landing at Normandy at a different place. This is not to say that the Germans didn't have this uh, this Atlantic, you know, seawall, huge fortifications, big guns. They did have those, but they were more spread out and less defensible than um, than the fortifications right across the English Channel from from the British. So D-Day takes place June 6, 1944. It's an invasion fleet of 2,700 ships about carrying uh, over 176,000 soldiers across the channel. Paratroopers are dropped behind enemy lines to cap capture key bridges and railroad tracks. So they drop paratroopers in while you know Marines are com coming in on, on land and so they're trying to secure the beach and you know key areas from both ends. At dawn, battleships open fire at the beaches at 6 a.m. Troops in the U.S., France, Canada, Great Britain storm ashore on a 60-mile front. It's the largest seaborne invasion in history. Um, it is not just the Americans who participate in D-Day. I mean, you've got, you know, it's a it's a coalition of multiple nations who are, you know, joining in this effort to storm these beaches and to make headway in um, finally defeating Hitler and, and gaining some ground on continent, the European continent. So although D-Day took the Germans by surprise, they fought back fiercely. By the end of 1944, about a million Allied troops were in France. So now they've got a staging point in France, and they can start pushing against Hitler for real. Um, we've got uh, ships here. These are landing crafts. You've got uh, individual soldiers who are getting out and fighting along the beaches. Is what the landing craft look like. It looks like a, 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 a ship that's going in reverse with this, you know, tailgate thing that slams down and, and then, you know, Marines rush out. So the Allies did not break through the German lines until the end of July. When they did, uh, George Patton, who broke through uh, and had the Germans as they, they retreated, um, push in on, uh, uh, on the Germans and keep the offensive going as much as possible. Paris ends up being liberated in August 25th. Hitler orders retreating Germans to obliterate the city, but they refuse to carry out his orders. Paris is one of these iconic cities and they didn't, you know, they, they chose to not destroy Paris. And thank goodness for that. Okay. Um, Eisenhower. Yes. Patton. Patton. That's Patton. Why am I saying? Yeah. It's been a long day. Patton. Okay. Three-star general at that point. Battle of the Bulge. So, we're surrounding Germany now. We're getting close to Berlin. Uh, Patton does not 
uh, allow the Germans to rush. He push, pushes them further and further in, inland um, and farther than anyone imagined in so short a time. He stops only when his tanks run out of fuel, and the German generals know they're beaten, but Hitler pulled all of his remaining resources for one last assault. So the idea is they're going to break through the Allied lines, and then, you know, maybe attack them from the rear and, you know, push them out and expel them. So, December 16, 1944, German troops surprise and overwhelm the Americans in the, uh, the Ardennes Forest in Belgium and Luxembourg. Uh, however, the Germans lack troops and um, to sustain this effort. So, had they had more men, more supplies, etc., this might have been more effective. This is known as the Battle of Bulge, but, you know, they do break through the lines, but it is it. The, the Allies are able to push them back. Um, I pull up this map. These are, you know, U.S. Um, units that were involved in the Battle of the Bulge. And so you have the Germans who are pushing out into the Arden Forest. And, you know, they're attacking Bastogne. Um, and they're cordoned off and, and pushed back again. And Nazi Germany ends up collapsing as a result of being squeezed from all sides. They're not able to maintain the industry or um, you know military you know fighting power and prowess that they had you know previously in the war. They're losing the Battle of Attrition. Late 1944, the Russians are closing from the east. The U.S. and Britain are closing from the west, German cities are destroyed, you know, new B-17 bombers are dropping tons of bombs in Germany day and night, and the only way to stop German war production is to destroy German bridges and railroads and factories and power plants and cities and everything, and the flying fortress is flying over, and as well as, you know, British and, and, and other aircraft and, and destroying cities and, and absolutely everything in, in Germany to a point where they are no longer able to put up a fight. Okay, um, Germans did hold on to hope with these secret weapons that they, you know, they're, they're like, hey, we've got these secret weapons that we have and we're going to use them to defeat the these allies once and for all. They developed the first jet airplane fighter, but they couldn't get enough in production to actually gain an advantage in the war. They come up with guided missiles, which, I mean, had they had nuclear weapons and guided missiles, this would have been a very different war. So they, they're developing these, uh, Werner von Braun is developing these, these rockets to, you know, attack England. There's a lot of problems and complications with the development of these missiles um, that that whole trope about, uh, um, well, it's not riot, rocket science, um, you know, insinuating that rocket science is very complicated and difficult. Well, this is the advent of rocket science. And yes, it was insanely complicated and difficult. Um, but again, these are being made way too late in the war to provide any real strategic advantage. April of 1945, Hitler makes his last stand. He chooses to die deep in an underground bunker in Berlin. The Russians reach the city, surround it. German armies surrender, destroyed. Uh, it's mainly the Hitler youth, kids aged you know, 13 to 15 years old who are defending Britain, Britain or Berlin. Sorry, not Britain. And Hitler, he's underground in his bunker, and the story is he, you know, commits suicide along with his wife. And uh, when his top, top general is asked for his last order, he says, let Germany go down in ashes. It is not fit to survive me. Obviously, they didn't burn down Germany. Anyways, one week later, on May 7, 1945, Germany ends up surrendering. And this is another one of the, like, super weapons that, was built. This is a cannon. It was used once. Um, the shell that fired out of this thing um, heats the barrel up so much that 
it's not really able to be fired very many times. Uh, that is a double track railroad that has to be used and built to mobilize this thing. And it's insanely expensive. Hitler was into big things. Um, impressive weapon, absolutely. Terrifying, yes. Uh, providing real strategic advantage in the war, no, not so much. Okay, and the same thing with this one. This is one of uh, uh, Hitler's ideas for a giant tank that's going to overwhelm all the other tanks. You know, the Sherman tank, the American Sherman tank was much smaller, but it was also much more mobile. This thing sunk in the ground and, and could hardly move in most terrain. And so because it was so massive and so heavy, it was basically completely worthless. I mean, it was a giant tank. It was very impressive, but didn't really make an impact in the war. You know, This was a good design, the Messerschmitt the, uh, fighter plane. But again, they come in way too late to actually make any real difference. Same with, I believe this is a V-2 rocket. Um, might be a version one, but I think that's a V-2. Yeah, it's a diagram of a V-2 rocket. Okay, so what happens to Germany? It's in ruins, factory, refinery, railroad, etc. ceases to operate. Millions more are homeless. It's impossible to rebuild. You know, uh, the victorious allies divide Germany into four sections. Each is supposed to be under the control of that country. And they disagree on what to do with Germany. The Russians wanted Germany permanently permanently split up between East and West Germany. They don't want any factories rebuilt. They want to punish Germany like they had been punished uh, through the Treaty of Versailles in World War I. They want Germany to, to be a big farming nation without any army. The United States and other allies want a new Germany trained to love democracy and freedom, um, saying you're not going to be allowed to have an armed forces, but they're not going to be punished for World War II, like they were punished after World War I, okay? And East and West Germany become very, very different places after World War II, okay? Trouble with the Russians. The Russians are angry over the United States. Plans for Germany, uh, the U.S. Came, comes come home, the Russians' armies stayed. And, you know, a line is drawn in, in the middle of Berlin. You have East Berlin and West Berlin, and two very, very different places, one led by Soviet Russia and the USSR and the other, you know, uh, being rebuilt by the Americans. They become two very, very different places. It soon becomes apparent that Russians, the Russians aren't going home. Uh, it wasn't just Germany that Russia's taken care of uh, or taken control over, uh, and he has no intention of giving up the territory that he took during World War II and they were forced to become communists. Places like Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, Albania. And this is be the beginning of the Cold War, where now, instead of everyone versus the nationalists, it's, uh, it's, the dem it's democracy versus communism. Uh, capitalism versus communism, etc. Okay, you end up with you know Gorbachev and and John F. Kennedy and the Cuban Missile Crisis and and all of the problems that uh, that ensue with with that. Now, um, don't have time to get into the Pacific Theater really uh, with with this video. I might make a video on that uh, at some other time, um, but yeah. Um, that's that's a whole another story. So thus ends the European theater. Thank you so much for watching.